If reproduction and development in herbivorous insects are as adversely affected by the levels of host plant nitrogen as most of the data suggests, then we might expect various adaptations to evolve that allow herbivores to buffer themselves against low nitrogen levels. Today we'll talk about some of these adaptations, which include compensatory feeding or variable feeding rates, the selection of high nitrogen sites on a host plant, tracking optimal resources in space and time, either through migration or diapause. We already talked about this a little bit. The modification or manipulation of a host plant by an herbivore to increase the available nitrogen. This is kind of hijacking uh, the plant itself. Or obtaining nitrogen from non-host plant resources, even if you are uh, an herbivore. Let's start with the first one, compensatory feeding. So what is compensatory feeding? And the short of it is, you just eat more food. If the food is low in nitrogen, you just take in a lot more of it. Now, as we talked about in the ecological stoichiometry uh, section, there are some risks of doing this. One is that you may be exposed to toxins in the plants, in your food, that come along with the ride if you're trying to get a lot of nitrogen. And the flip side is that you will get an excess source of carbon that you have to get rid of as you are trying to get that, that nitrogen. So nitrogen occurs in very dilute concentration in plants. So eating more tissue, either by increasing the rate or increasing the amount of time feeding on that plant, uh, is one way to actually do this. These are examples of insects that have higher feeding rates in an attempt to get more, more nitrogen. Aphids, a lot of sap feeding insects that are tapped into the phloem. And remember, the phloem is even lower in percent nitrogen than leaf tissue is. So if you're a leaf chewing insect, you have a different set of, uh, of challenges compared to phloem feeding insects. And one thing you can do is process a lot of plant juice and to capture that, that nitrogen. So these are spittle bugs. And spittle bugs have this name because in the process of trying to get at that scarce nitrogen, they're pumping through a lot of that carbohydrates, a lot of that uh, sugary solution out of their body along with water and along uh, with other things. Uh, aphids do this really well. They actually secrete a substance called honeydew. This honeydew is rich in sugar. Uh, and uh, there you can actually, this sugary stuff, sometimes there's so many aphids that the sugary stuff actually will fall out of the trees and blanket the ground um, or your car if you're parked underneath it. And various other organisms actually have learned to take advantage of this. Ants in particular that love uh, sugar that need uh, carbon uh, will actually tend aphids and uh, harvest this, uh, this secretion that comes from um, uh, that comes out of their guts, basically out of their, um, out of the hind gut. Insects that are adapted to feeding on phloem and xylem have what is referred to as a filter chamber. That is, the front part of the midgut forms a thin-walled bladder that actually wraps around the hind gut, the posterior part of the hind gut, and part of the malpighian tubules. The malpighian tubules are these tendril-like things that come out of the uh, at the junction of the hindgut and the midgut that are basically like the kidneys of insects. They serve as a water transport mechanism. And what you can get is the selective re retention of amino nitrogen and the elimination of excess sugars because of this uh, of this filter chamber. And basically what happens is that the insect uh, cells in this area secrete car uh, secrete potassium and chloride salts basically into this area of in the posterior uh, midgut and create an osmotic potential that basically pulls water out of the hemolymph and back into the um, and back into the hindgut and that's how it gets excreted. So imagine making a really briny solution, a really salt briny solution that's going to try to balance out osmotically and by and the way it does that is by pulling water out of the tissues after it had been absorbed into uh, into the body. So that's what the filter chamber uh, actually is. Getting rid of water is a problem with xylem insects because these are the ones feeding on the water that comes up. Getting rid of sugar is for the phloem insects that uh, that are feeding on the photosynthate rich um, plant juices coming back from the leaves. Increasing feeding rate is another way to get at that, that nitrogen that may be in low concentrations. 
This is an experiment that they did looking at leaf consumption rate, how much plant material was eaten in a certain amount of time for different stages of these monarch caterpillars when they were fed on either low nitrogen plants compared to high nitrogen uh, milkweeds. And what you can see here is that, you know, in all cases through all developmental stages, the lower the nitrogen uh, content of the milkweeds, the more they actually fed in order to make up that, that difference. Another way to get at low nitrogen is to feed for a really long time. Things like periodical cicadas that feed as nymphs on the roots of, uh, of plants, the roots where the xylem is coming in is very poor uh, in nitrogen. And, uh, and their developmental times can be on the magnitude of decades uh, almost. And most of the cicadas uh, species uh, that we have actually are xylem fe feeders and generally have life cycles that are beyond, beyond a year. It just takes that long to get at that nitrogen uh, pool. Here's some other examples of xylem feeders, including um, spittlebugs, cercopids, and uh, um, cicadas. Another way to buff buttress against uh, low nitrogen is to go to places in the plant where the nitrogen is the highest. Nitrogen is not distributed evenly throughout a plant. Here's an example with plant hoppers again, feeding on plant parts that have variability in their plant nitrogen. And here you can see that the number of plant hoppers tends to be highest in areas where the plant nitrogen is the highest, which in this case was the flowering parts of the, of the plant. Plants have different nitrogen dynamics in them depending on the time of season, the plant part, uh, and so on. Very rapidly growing plant parts are areas where nitrogen needs to be moved in in order for growth of the plant tissues to actually happen. And as a consequence, these are places in the plants where, where aphids tend to uh, aggregate. So aphid, the oleander aphid, uh, aphis nerii, and also feeds on all kinds of other things, including uh, milkweeds, moves from the leaves during the early part of the season where leaves are rapidly growing into the seed pods or onto the seed pods where the seed pods are developing and eventually onto senescing leaves as nitrogen is broken down from proteins and moved into more mobile forms so that it can be translocated into overwintering uh, parts. Insects like aphids that have legs and are mobile uh, are able to track this within a plant over the course of a season. Less mobile insects, like scale insects, are actually much more sensitive to variability in host plant nitrogen uh, because they can't actually go and select the plant material out there. Another example of selecting uh, plants that have uh, higher concentrations of nitrogen is to actually seek them out in space and time. I gave you the previous example was within a plant and moving to tissues within a plant that had higher nitrogen over the course of a season. The same can actually be seen um, across a lot of different uh, plant species. Uh, early on in the season, plants tend to have high water and high nitrogen. And as plants age and eventually senesce here, they tend to get tougher, drier, and lower nitrogen. This was seen for oak trees, for black cherry trees, for corn, for alfalfa, for cabbage. There tends to be this negative trend here between um, in water and in nitrogen concentration. I already gave the example of sycamore aphids. I'm not going to repeat it uh, here. You also have uh, examples of host alternation by some insects that actually will feed on completely different plants depending on the season, like the bird cherry oat aphid. Bird cherry oat actually refers to the host alternation of this particular uh, aphid, very common aphid, the Rapalocyphum uh, padi, where it feeds on trees early in the spring, presumably again, because this is where the most of the nitrogen is. And then they switch to oak plants, so grasses, a completely different uh, order of, uh, of plants uh, here uh, in the summer before switching back to prunus, uh, bird cherry oat, uh, in the fall. So this is an example of resource tracking over space and over time. Here's a really cool way that insects can mobilize nitrogen within a plant by modifying it themselves. Aggregation of insects onto plant parts 
like this, and pulling away carbon, because they're phloem feeders, they're, they're getting a lot of carbon, tricks the plant into thinking that these are these that there's an imbalance in the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the uh, in the phloem tissue and what the plant what plants do in response to the, this damage is actually move more nitrogen into these areas this uh, is referred to as a carbon uh, or a nutrient sink where plants mobilize uh, resources to account for these imbalances with, within their own tissues. And it's actually the insects that have created uh, these imbalances. So they can kind of keep the, uh, keep the nutrients coming by actually feeding on, uh, on, the, on these plant tissues. Insects have actually gotten really good at co-opting plant physiology to, uh, uh, to their own uh, ends. Here you can see a series uh, of diverse structures that are frequently referred to as galls, where inside of this, there is a tiny little insect, and the plant has basically been hijacked in order to create these structures that are rapidly growing. And remember, rapidly growing usually means more carbon and more nitrogen uh, coming to them, and sometimes even double as a shelter uh, for insects. And the way they do this is still a bit of a mystery, but, but it's basically using uh, some plant signaling uh, compounds generated by the insects themselves to convince the plant to generate these uh, these abnormal uh, structures uh, right here. Here's a gall here. Sometimes these are uh, bizarrely shaped. Sometimes they look like, um, like a, yeah, here's a classic oak gall here, which actually gets leathery and um, and hard on the outside. And yet on the inside, there are some insects that are feeding on the juicy tissues uh, in here. So sometimes when you see these funny structures growing on the side of a leaf or on the side of a stem, these often have insects or mites are also really good at creating these, um, these structures that they can take advantage uh, of. And finally, herbivorous insects also can obtain nitrogen from other, other sources that are not uh, plants. The most common way to do this is to actually cannibalize other insects. So maybe there's some flexibility in whether insects are uh, entirely herbivorous if, if they are plant feeding. So why feed on resources that are one to two percent nitrogen, where by feeding on maybe your siblings or other herbivores here, you can get 12 percent or 10 percent nitrogen right away. So cannibalism, especially with uh, young uh, with young stages, is very common in, uh, in many uh, insects, both predators and uh, herbivores. Sometimes there is uh, opportunistic carnivory or omnivory. So for an herbivore, uh, they can mix their diets by feeding on other non-plant material like other insects. Species like uh, these plant bugs, uh, Ligus hesperus, are um, famous for doing this. And in fact, sometimes they act as uh, biological control agents. Penatomids do this a lot. In fact, I couldn't help but include this video here of a penatomid that I saw today that had uh, skewered a uh, striped cucumber beetle. And if you look carefully here, the uh, female, which is on the bottom, that is being sucked out by the penatomid is actually be in the process of uh, being mated by this male who seems oblivious to what's happening uh, around him. Another way to get at uh, nitrogen is to recycle, either by feeding on exuvi or the chorion, that is the sh cast outer shell of, uh, of an egg. Uh, so you'll often see this behavior where caterpillars will feed on the shell of the egg, which may ha still have a little bit of nitrogen uh, on there. Coprophagy, that is the feeding on an other animal's waste is also seen in some insects. Butterflies do this a lot, where they will put their proboscis into splatters of, uh, in, of, uh, bird, uh, fe of um, bird uh, feces or other animal uh, feces. And that's because some of these um, excreta actually are very rich in uh, salts or in other nutrients that might be absent in the uh, host plants of, uh, of these insects. You often see these aggregations of um, butterflies, sometimes near stream banks, where the uh, water has kind of dropped back a little bit, and there's these crusted little pools of concentrated uh, ions that uh, you'll see the 
uh, you'll see these butterflies actually uh, a behavior that's called puddling. There are many other examples that I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to have a chance to go into. Some insects have uh, obligate relationships with microbes, endosymbionts that live in, the, in their guts that allow them to actually get access to particular uh, nutrients that they otherwise uh, wouldn't, um, wouldn't have access to and all kinds of other really interesting uh, behaviors.